we'll get started here. Uh, and Marsha, I promise not to take your notes when I take my notes, but that just never works well. Um, good morning, I'm Ryan Nelson. I'm the Vice President of Institutional Advancement here at Dunwoody. On behalf of Dunwoody and its Alumni Association, it's my pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker. Recently named one of the Twin Cities Business Magazine's notable women in commercial real estate, Martha Davies collaborates with clients, architects, developers, and custom builders on key commercial, multifamily, and residential projects in the Twin Cities and across the U.S., Mexico, and Costa Rica. Well, that be fun trips. In addition to her interior design work, Martha is actively involved in the Twin Cities philanthropic community. She co-founded and supports Paths Packs, a nonprofit that supports chronically ill children and their families, and donates her time, talents, and resources for diabetes advocacy. Martha currently serves on the Board of Trustees at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. She has also served on the Board of Trustees at the Minnesota Children's Museum and the Walker Art Center, right next door, and the Board of Trustees of multiple committees at the Blake School, which has a really big thread running through Dunwoody. She is a co-founder of the Friends of the Pacer Board for the Pacer Center, and she's passionate about education and after receiving her graduate degree at Boston University, was a teacher for deaf children. Martha will be talking design, and we'll be joined by Corinne Howard, Director, Director of Interior Design and Graphic Design at Dunwoody College, as they discuss Martha's work as a residential and commercial designer and the positive impact that Dunwoody College has had on her business and the Twin Cities design community. I think this is the first interior design lead speaker series um, presentation for us. So really excited about this. And uh, so keep watching our video. Yesterday, am I standing too? I came yesterday for a tour and was blown away. This uh, Dunwoody is incredibly impressive. I think you all are so lucky and uh, our community is so lucky to have Dunwoody right here. Um, so I was awake in the middle of the night just thinking of all the possibilities and all the partnerships and all the tours I want to take students on. And I just, uh, and I will introduce you to one of my own employees in the a little bit, but um, this is an amazing institution, so thank you for having me. Uh, so my backstory, I get asked quite a bit with informational interviews. When you get old, people want an informational interview. And if there are students here who are asking us, and when we say, no, we're too busy, just keep pounding us, because eventually we will do an informational interview. And they, I get asked all the time, you know, what's your background? And I will tell you I'm the luckiest person in the world when it comes to my background. Um, and, and landing where I have. I have a uh, bachelor's degree in psychology, which as you know, gets you absolutely nowhere. And so I left as a, my undergraduate degree and coming from a retail family, went right to a retail training management program and worked at an East Coast department store. Um, and that was fairly short lived. And so I went back to graduate school and had a master's in education with a specialty in deaf education. And I taught deaf students for about four years. So I'm probably more comfortable up here signing, but you know, you would understand that, so I'll keep, keep going. Um, I came back to Minneapolis in, uh, when I was about 27 years old and had no formal training in design, and I bought a condominium. But I had renovated a bunch of homes on the East Coast uh, and loved doing it and would flip them or rent them. And so I came back here and basically bought a piece of dirt and uh, said to the developer, I'll do that, but I want to change the walls, I want to change the plan, I want to... Let's just change like, the project, actually. <laughs> and um, by the end of it, he said, you want a job? And I said, well, I would love a job. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and so uh, I ended up working for him for about six years as his director of design, and then started my own firm in 2005. Um, today I have eight employees who are fed fantastic. Um, so I, I have no formal training. And when I toured yesterday, I think I'm going to be applying to Dunwoody <laughs> because I could want all the tools and the teachers and the, and the classrooms that I saw. 
So that's really my backstory. I'm going to get into that further, but um, it's, um, I, I just, again, I, my team and the people that work with me are the ones who are really trained, so I'm very fortunate. This is where we work every day. Um, it is a happy, fun, lovely office that I just, um, it, it makes each one of us inspired and uh, fills us with kind of the, the design intent every day. Right down the street, by the way, about a mile from here. So I feel very lucky that we get to uh, do our work there, but we're across the street from International Market Square. So we're back and forth every day, all day, but we spend a lot of time. But we're also close to so many of the different architecture firms that we work with and collaborate with. So it's a great location for us. Um, this is a little bit, uh, this, this is the front of our office. We see this when we walk in, and we see it when we leave. And it's a little bit, I would say, the motto of our office. And um, as I said, I have no, no training, and, and there's, a, there's a phrase that's, you know, fake it till you make it, and I guess I don't really believe that. I think it's um, ask questions and ask for help and, and figure it out um, with the people around you. And so when I started, uh, I, had, I had no idea what I was doing, to be honest. Um, and again, that's where, to me, done work is so valuable. If your students go out, you, you know what you're doing, and you're entering the market, and people can't wait for you to do that. I came into the market and asked a lot of questions. There's a little bit of faking in it, um, but, but generally it's, we, we, we dive in and we ask a lot of questions and we really value and rely on the partnerships in our community that we're so lucky to have. This, um, so I'm gonna walk you through a couple projects. This one is um, a home that we finished last year in Cabo, which was not a better place to go on site that is a good crack. Um, this was in partnership with Peterson Keller Architects, and I know that Gabe is actually really close to Dunwoody and that they do a lot of work in conjunction with Peterson Keller Architects. And so this, we've done three projects now in Cabo, but this one, um, we two of them have been with Peterson Keller, and it's uh, been really fun to collaborate here, travel together, and make sort of connections in a new community. We do both commercial and residential projects. I would say we do about 60% residential and probably 40% multifamily and commercial projects. So this is a residence that we did in Fargo. Um, actually happens also to be with, a, with Peterson Keller and a builder in Fargo. And a ground up, new build, um, sort of a farmhousey style. And it's, um, it's just a reflection, I think, of, of the new builds that we do. We do a lot of renovation work, um, and then we also do a lot of multifamily. In addition, um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a great example of a, of a renovation project. This is a beautiful home right down on uh, Lake of the Isles. We've actually worked on this home over and over and over throughout the years, they just keep liking to, uh, they like to change things, but the renovation of an old home in our community where we've got so many beautiful old historic homes, especially down here on the lakes, uh, is, is really fun, and it's where we lean heavily on, again, the architecture department and the skills of the architects that we work with to make sure that we're restoring it impeccably, and then we get to come in and add the, the fun and the flair with the with the design and the, and the furniture to make it kind of pop. Uh, this is another old home in Kenwood, actually. Um, truth be told, is my home. Um, and so it, I think we, I put this in there just because it's a, an example of, again, taking a house that was built in 1892, um, and there's a lot of controversy about painting old you know, woodwork and the details. I think in our firm, we believe strongly in honoring the bones of a house, or the bones of a building, but then having some fun and some flair on the inside. And so this was an example of that. And this is actually, I think, going to be published this spring. And then there's the whole other side of our business, um, which is the multifamily and commercial side. And I know that Dunwoody does a lot with multifamily. Um, I saw some examples in the hallway yesterday, which were incredibly impressive. We, uh, we work for about four different developers in the Twin Cities. Um, we've done some work outside the Twin Cities as well with developers, and just, uh, again, have great relationships with people that we think are doing really great work. 
So the collaboration generally is between the building architect and then the design architect. We have usually two firms on there, and we're working most closely with the design architects on the lobbies, the common area spaces. Sometimes we dabble and do the uh, modeling units, and we might do some of the interiors on the units, but we really specialize in what do the common area spaces look like? How do people live in there? What is the demographic? Who's using the building? And then how do we take our residential experience and make it feel warm and comfortable so that when these when these owners are, or residents are coming home at the end of the day, how does it feel good and like it's their home? So this is a, a project right down in the North Loop that we finished about six months ago, eight months ago. Um, and one of our current favorites is really fun and large. Uh, the 11 on the River, if you don't uh, uh, know, is the new building down by the stadium and the Guthrie. Um, it was, it is fantastic. We closed our first resident about four days ago, and in the next uh, four to five months, we will move in over 70 new homeowners. It is 42 stories high. Um, was designed by Robert Stern out of New York, and has made an incredible. I think a statement, and it's a great addition to our skyline. And we were really fortunate to work on, on this building for the last really four years. It's been a labor of love, and it's fun to start to see in the next couple of months. We will move in on our, at, at our team, we'll move in about 12 homeowners, but as a total, we've worked with pretty much every buyer that, that bought in this building. This is one of the units that we named the Chelsea, which is the most contemporary. We had a contemporary. Uh, choice, a transitional, if you will, I don't like that word, but a, a transitional choice, and then a little more traditional, but still very urban. So it was really fun. We were really fortunate to get to work on this. And Star, actually, of my entire presentation is not me, it's <coughs> my employee, Corey Reckinger, who is a Dunwoody grad, um, who came to my office seven years ago, actually sent me an email and said, I hear you're losing somebody on your team and I'd like a job. And um, I, <laughs> truth be told, I already told the story, I forgot that we had the interview when I was home making dinner and I got a text that said, are we supposed to be meeting right now? <laughs> um, and he still came to work for me. And, uh, for the, and as I said earlier, uh, for the, I am not, trained, I, my, my talents are on the job, and I learned on the job. My right-hand person, my design director, is the exact same as I, she's my same age, and she and was a jewelry designer. So we both, uh, we ran the business, we did, we did just fine, and then Corey came along. Um, and he had all the skills that he learned here, he had all the background from Dunwoody, he had the computer talents, he knew how to put together a presentation, and so he came and joined, and literally our business just went like this. And so I am extremely grateful for Corey. He runs my commercial, entire commercial department. And Corey, just give a little space. Yes. <laughs> Great question. I, I think, and I've alluded to it a little bit. The um, I, 
think when I started over about 25 years ago, um, there was a core group of people that were in the in the industry. But I'm not, and, and many of them had the backgrounds like Corey did. But I think you could get by without having that. And I think today's um, designers and the people coming out of school are so well trained and so well educated that I don't think I could I couldn't enter this market like I did 25 years ago. Um, and again, I think that the um, that the students that Dunwoody and the UN are, are producing are so talented. Um, so I don't, I don't know that we could bake it as well as I did 25 years ago. We didn't have that, that education. Um, and, and the students are, are so talented. So I just think that, that the level of talent has risen enormously. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is, how did how has the pandemic um, affected your work? They, a lot. Um, people are at home, and, you know, everybody's at their home, and they need a home office, and they need a Zoom background, and they need somewhere to get away from their families to do work, and uh, our business has, has exploded in the last three years, to be honest. Um, we did not have a downtime. We didn't, nobody in my office got a day off. Um, <laughs> sorry, for um, so we, we worked straight through, um, and I think it's. I think people are spending so much time in their homes now and valuing that and, and enjoying that, but they're also looking around and saying, "Oh, I really need wallpaper in my bathroom, and my Zoom background doesn't look so good. Can you fix that?" And um, so we're going back to our. A lot of our uh, existing clients want small projects, but we're also getting um, full full home rebuilds and full remodels, and uh, and for sure the commercial market and the multifamily as you've seen in our city is is thriving. So that has not slowed down whatsoever. Yeah, the industry has just picked up really fast, which is really exciting um, for all of us here. Our students are in high demand, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, maybe like a challenging project or client um, that you um, work with or worked on? Um, well, one of our one of our roles is we can complain in our office, but you're not allowed to say a thing about a client when you leave at the end of the day, <laughs> uh, because we see them all in the community. <laughs> so we do have that role. So I will say that I like, but I will say I've thought about that a lot. Um, I would say there the, a challenge for us is anything that we that we haven't experienced before and need to study, and it could be. Um, we're doing a tutor home on Minnehaha Creek, and we need to do all custom lighting. And so we'll spend, you know, two months studying what does what does that lighting look like? What should it look like? We're hiring somebody to make it. How do we do that? What's appropriate for the house? Um, you know, it's it's glamorous, or it appears glamorous to work in Cabo in Costa Rica. I don't get me wrong, it's great. Um, but how do you import? How do you get a container? How do you send product out there? How do you um, speak Spanish? to install it correctly. And Corey's gotten really good at learning how to use all the uh, devices on his phone uh, with Spanish translation when we're down there and can't figure out what we want to do that we not this them. So I would say the, the challenges in a fun way for us are, are learning uh, learning new things on every, pretty much every project we're on. Um, every, every project brings something that's even different. So this is kind of a, a nice tie-in question. Um, I think often when we're working with clients, we're also educating them um, about what the process is. Can you talk a little bit about um, what your process is working with the client and how you kind of educate them about what you're going to do for them? Yeah. Um, when, we, when we start with a client, we start with um, asking them a lot of questions. Tell us about how you want to live in your home. Tell us how you're going to use your home. What it, usually it's, you know, a, a, it probably usually, but it could be one person, it could be a couple. If it's a couple, then it's how do you both envision living in this house? What do you use? Pinterest, do you have magazine cutouts? Um, I know that's a little old school, but people still do read magazines. Um, <laughs> do, you know, do you have a folder of, of your image? And so we start with what's your vision, and then we talk about the process, and the process um, first and foremost in our office, then we'll lose it has to be fun. If we're not having fun here, this isn't working for you and for us. 
And it's stressful. I think when people are in their homes, it's their most valuable asset. They're expensive, and they're trusting us to work on that. And that's a big responsibility. So we talk about, um, you know, what are their needs first, and then, then secondly, what's your design, your design goal, and what's your vision, and how can we help you achieve your vision? It should look like you, not like us. And so we talk through that process, and then it's the nitty gritty. This is how we're going to work. This is the process. This is the schedule and the timing. And we remind them throughout. This is fun. Um, it's not always fun. <laughs> and, and, and we're tired of spending money, and you get to the end, and it's late, and it's over budget, and all of those things. And so we're always saying, it's really great. It's fun. Um, but that's that's sort of part of our job. You sound like me. <laughs> How do you do it? It's exciting. Um, so I'm kind of going off script here a little bit, but um, can you talk a little bit about maybe how many times you're coming up with ideas? Like, what is your ideation process? Like, how many times is the client coming back to you and saying they want change? And you know, what is that? How does that make you feel? <laughs> maybe <laughs> you know. I think as designers, we maybe think. Oh, our first idea is the best idea. Um, can you talk a little bit about it? You know how you keep ideas flowing with clients. Clients change their mind all the time, um, and sometimes in really good ways. And then you know you take a step back and think, well, that actually is really a good idea. And sometimes, yes, it completely throws up what we think are the perfect ideas. I would say also that again, we are so lucky. We have such good architect firms in the in the Twin Cities, and we collaborate so closely with them. Um, and I always say in our office, the, the more the more design heads are on the table, the better the idea. So the client, the architect, and usually at least two members of my team are around the table working on what's going to go into the project. Um, so I would, daily, daily something is changing. Uh, if not multiple times a day. And then in our office, too, we have, I have eight people, and we have two big tables in the middle, and everything is sort of laid out. We try to keep it neat, but generally everything's laid out on those tables, and we're always calling each other in. Like, is this a good idea? What do you think about this? Um, uh, does this work? What would you do if you were leading this project? So I would say every day, all day, we're changing. By the end of the project, you're hoping that there aren't too many changes, but throughout the process, we're, we're changing until it's feasible. Great, and I think that's great for everybody to hear just this collaboration and talking through ideas um, is really important, so thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some gaps that you might see in the industry um, that, are, that can be filled? Right here. I mean, I would say every one of my incredible vendors and subcontractors in the market is looking, whether it's the flooring company or the wallpaper company or the painters or um, the contractors. Every one of them has reached out in the last two years saying, do you know anybody looking? I'll take anybody. I don't care what their background is. If they'll show up with a smile on their face, I will teach them what to do. Um, so I have the biggest guy, I would say, I'm going to say a thousand times, when all my guys and women are going to retire, I'm out because there's there's just we need the we need the backfill, and they're desperately looking for people. There just aren't enough people in in the in the trades out in the in the marketplace, and so all the people we've used for 20 years um, are constantly looking. So I would say that's the biggest gap to me. It's not to, the, the talent is there, but it's um, there's there's not enough. There aren't enough people. Um, you talked a little bit about um, collaborating. Can you talk more about the different disciplines that you are collaborating with on a regular basis? For sure, architecture um, and construction. We work really, really closely with the contractors. Um, the our job is to stay ahead of the contractors, so we're, we're in constant communication with scheduling what comes next. They'll call us and say, "Can you come to on site? I've got a question for you." Um, so for sure, architecture and contractors, the electricians, we work with extensively on uh, reflective ceiling plans and then site visits and walkthroughs. Um, oh gosh, Corey, who else? Every, um, uh, pretty much all the trades, and we're meeting them on site. So doing site visits and working with them closely. Uh, Corey does it, you know, daily on the commercial stuff. 
the, the commercial projects. Uh, residential, we do the, the walkthroughs, but we are, I would say they're mostly architects and contractors. Um, do you have a project that you would like to revisit? If you could. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure, Costa Rica. And I packed will be going in May. Um, and then I'm taking uh, about seven people down. We have a, a second home, just are finishing in Costa Rica, uh, which will be done in May. And so we're staying at the first house that we did, which I think I shouldn't have a favorite. It's like I'm a favorite child. Um, and, um, but I, that's probably my favorite project I've ever done. So we'll stay at that house and install the second house. So how long? How long does a project like that take? We started the the second home in Costa Rica about two and a half years ago. Um, so it's 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 a long time. You can be on a project for a very long time. Um, and Corey and I've been working on it from day one for straight years. So it's um, loaded. We're loading the second container next week. We'll send a third container, and then eight, seven of us will go down for about a week. It's a big. It's a very big house. So would you say, um, you know, as far as timeline, around that two-year mark is usually one of the longest projects you've worked on? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. For, for a new build, I would say a new build is generally about two, two and a half years. By the, cause we start literally at the beginning with the architects. So they're, when they do schematic design, we're sitting at the table. So I would say that for us is the beginning of a project, and then, you know, installing it. It, that could be two, two and a half years, and then it, we usually wait about two months, and then we photograph it. So it could be a two and a half, three year project. Um, I would, renovation is probably a little different, but a, but a big renovation could be a year and a half as well. Um, how many projects are you working on at one time? Way too many. Um, <laughs> I would say right now we've got 30. Wow. Too many? <laughs> it's, um, so, and so I would say if, for a team of, of really seven and we've got a paid intern, it's hard to put your finger on the, on what's the right amount because they, they have and flow so much and they could be really intense and you might not get any answers for two weeks. So it's really hard to take a load of work and keep it consistent. Um, I would say if I could be a psychologist, I'd book my hours for six hours a day. I'd be in really good shape, but that doesn't happen in, in this industry. So I would say um, I, I would say we probably have five too many, but we're getting there. We're working on. So work-life balance. Talk about that a little bit. <laughs> <There's>, uh, <laughs> I'm lucky that I love what I do, um, but I would say I don't have very good balance. I encourage my team to try. Um, I, you know, I talked about sort of what are your interests outside of here. I love coming in after the weekend and hearing what they've done because um, I'm usually sitting at my computer. So I'm, I'm striving to have a better work life balance. Yeah, we do um, personal and professional bests around here at meetings, and I struggle hard with the per for the personal best because it's usually always work. So I hear you. Yeah, that's great. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you are involved in community? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I, we are so lucky. Our community is amazing. And um, I don't love our weather, but I always say I wouldn't be here because our community is so special. I think um, we do some pro bono work, which um, has been really valuable. We did an incredible home this year for um, for them. unfortunately we started with seven um, sisters and they were there were six by the end of the project um, and built their home and their chapel and that was all pro bono and for us um, that kind of work is, is so valuable and so rewarding um, and I think I also encourage my team to be to be out and doing what interests them what, whatever it is that you're interested in get involved in that so you have some some work like balance for me. Um, MCAD is another organization in, the, in our cities that I'm really proud of that produces really good talent. So I've, I've chosen to be on the board of that right now. Um, but there, there are so many things to get involved with here and, and to do. And, and my team is, they all have their own interests, which is, is really valuable. So with the pro bono work, do you, are you kind of seeking that out or are people um, coming to you or? Generally they come to us. Um, 
we haven't had to seek that out. I think we there that we there are plenty of opportunities to do that should we need to. But so far it's people have come to us and said, Would you be willing to do this work? And we generally have a project or two that we're doing. Um, we'll switch gears a little bit, but do you have a design trend that you would like to see go away forever? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I knew there would be this question, so I did a little poll in my office on Friday afternoon and said, what do y'all hate? Uh, and I think we all land on stuff. It's a hard question because I'm going to offend somebody. <laughs> so I'm going to try to be really gentle. Um, I think we came up with the knockoff of the knockoff of the knockoff. <laughs> you know, the, the, it, by the time you knock something off the third time, you lose the, the design integrity. And so one of, my, one of my designers said, I can't stand fake mid-century modern. And so we dove into that for a little while and had a little discussion about what does it mean to be fake? And, uh, and I think we, we, we boiled it down to, by the time you've knocked it off so many times, the, the details are gone. So I think we like good, well-designed details, and maybe not so much from you. But, but at the same time, I will give you the caveat, I think design at every price point is extremely important. So the knockoffs are, are valuable. That's a good one. I'm just going to take that one. I'm going to take that one. <laughs> yeah. mine, I think mine, mine kind of offends people, so I'm not going to. What are the other? Yeah, well, I think I told you mine was um, the waterfall countertops. I'm sort of over it. <laughs> I know it's really, really trendy right now, but I feel like I look at them like all the time, and I just want the I want it to go away. I want there to be something new, and so I think that that definitely probably offends people, especially clients, because that's what they see, that's what they want. But um, yeah, I think I'm too close to the too close to it. Um, great. Um, would you encourage, what um, what types of um, community or organizations would you encourage students to get involved in? Whatever you're passionate about. You're going to live and breathe. I think if you're here, you live and breathe design and, and um, creative talent. So I go do something on the weekends that makes your heart sing. I think... Employers, for, for me, that's what I value. Um, I think you're naturally going to, to be drawn to things that are creative. And at the same time, if you like to canoe, go, go find things that I think are outside of design so that you can bring those talents and those skills back and, and give, your, give your brain a little rest. Um, you'll, you'll more than thrive in the design world. So whatever makes your heart change. Well, we know you hired Corey on the spot, and so I'm wondering, what are some characteristics that you look for in hiring? Um, that's a great question. Uh, fit for my studio is number one, and we kind of put through people through the ringers these days. We just hired somebody who, from Restoration Hardware. Uh, I didn't, Poach her. We were asked about poaching, so I definitely did not poach her. Um, she came to us, but um, we, we make somebody interview pretty much of that way in the office. And for me, I'm looking for enthusiasm. I'm looking for what are your interests outside? What, what, what else do you do? Um, not outside nature, but outside of, of design. Um, honesty, uh, hard work and willingness to admit what you don't know. Um, I, I think that coming, I have two very young designers right now, and I keep saying to them, we ask the questions. Tell me what you don't know. Yesterday we were talking about, I had a phone call about blocking, and I hung up the phone. I said, do you two know what blocking is? And they were trying so hard to give me the answer. And I said, the right answer is no, I don't know what blocking is. Let's <laughs> talk about what blocking is. Um, so we had a little, little talk about blocking yesterday. So I think somebody that's going to say, I don't, I don't know that, but boy, I'll go up my sleeves and figure it out. Um, yeah. Great. Um, if you had three words to describe your work, what would they be? Cohesive. Um, eclectic and hopefully fun. 
Has any questions uh, for Martha from uh, out here? Anybody have a question? Do you want to just raise your hand? I'll grab the mic up the mic to you so she can hear you. There you go. Hi, my name is Lydia. I'm a design student here. Um, and I just am interested in the multifamily particularly. And I wondered about um, the common areas, if you see trends in what is um, desired in those common areas. And then I think going along with that, do those common areas get used very much? And like, how can you connect those two things? Great question. Um, yes, they get used extensively. I would say, well, we, can we go back a lot after we've done them? And A, when we're photographing, but also just to go sit there and sort of see how they're getting used so that we can be better educated for the next building. Um, the trends that I think we've seen are that the units have gotten smaller. So you've got micro units and, um, and these teeny little apartments and maybe a one bedroom. But people need a place to get out and do work. So we are designing um, multi-purpose spaces. So it might be during the day that if we're doing a kitchen and a, a chef's kitchen, for example, we'll have a, a section that definitely has a banquet with tables and people are working there all day long and then it's being rented out that night. But we are consistently um, designing workspaces. We, we, a new trend for us is sort of what we call the telephone booth room, if you will. Um, which I saw projects upstairs that have those in them. And actually, you have them in your library. Uh, we're doing those a lot now in these, build in these buildings because people need a place to go work. The conference rooms and, the, and any of these multifamily buildings we do get used all the time. And while we used to do one conference room, now we're doing three. And we have one, usually one large one, and probably two additional conference rooms that are three to four people, and they're always full. Um, they're, also, we found that if you do sort of one large table, one person will be there and they've got the whole, whole table, and everybody else walks in and glares at them and then goes and finds another space. <laughs> so we, we're working on making sure that there are enough spaces for, for all these people to be able to get out of their units and go work. Um, the, I think other trends, dog washes and saunas and all of the things that are, um, you know, are new in the, in the industry are, are bike, uh, bike, fixing your bike, the bike station, the dog station, the, you know, we're doing all of those, uh, which is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to see what, if you're always trying to stay ahead, what's the next thing going to be that the residents want? But they, boy, they use the common a lot. Thank you. I saw a hand up over here. Well, thank you for coming in. Uh, so my question is about leadership. So I wrote down, how do you balance leading and managing your employees versus seeking uh, new business and development? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> not well. <laughs> I, uh, I am not, I will admittedly tell you, I am not the best manager of people. Um, before you probably like, yeah, that's true. Um, I, I try to spend time on each of my team members and, and meet with them. Um, but that, I would say, we spend a lot of time together working together. And so more of my management style is probably in, in training and working with them rather than sitting down and saying, but I, but I definitely try at least once or twice a year to sit down one on one, have a meeting. What do you need? How can I support you? What do you need from the studio? How can I foster your growth? Are there classes you want to take? What skills do you want to work on? Um, the and and I spend a lot of my time doing um, sort of the new the new business development and going to the initial meetings. And I'm at all of those for at least the first couple months of every project with a team member. And then if the team member starts to take over that project, and I fill in when I need to go to meetings. But I'm, I'm on the front end of every project for at least the first several meetings until my team member is comfortable, and then they start to run with it. But I always have two two team members on every project. Um, but I could definitely do a better job managing people. Good question. Another one right here. How do you admit? How do you uh, handle the business administration side of your 
business, you know, like contracts, procurement, payroll, the non fun design stuff. <laughs> the hardest part of my job. Um, I do way too much of that myself, would be the answer. Um, I, I, but I work with a good subcontractors, so I have a, a bookkeeper who comes in. Um, she was just, we just spent two full days together because they're not my favorite days. Um, I do all the contracts, but I, I would very much like to shift and have, you know, there's sort of a model of you've got the, the visionary and then you've got the expert. I haven't figured out how to not be controlling enough to give somebody the, some of the execution, but I'm working on that part. Um, it's not fun, but it's also good for me to know what's going on in my whole business. So I, I use a lot of subcontractors who are fantastic. Um, and, and they generally come in you know, once a week and I, and I work directly with them. It's not my favorite part of the job, though. Hi, Martha. Thank you very much for being here. Um, this is a question about you know overall design. How do you can you, you and your team design within a budget, and how do you manage your clients' expectations? Great question. Uh, we we ask the budget question, and I will tell you it's hard at the beginning of a project because a lot of clients will come in and say, "Well, we don't have a budget," but you realize very quickly everybody has a budget. Um, they're just not telling you what their budget is. And so we generally start with um, with our concept. And um, if it's a full home, you're working on the budget, obviously, with the contractors. So there's the budget of the house, and then there's the budget of the interiors. And we now will, um, we've got a whole process of spreadsheet galore that where we sit down and look at every piece that we think will go into that house, including accessories and art and sheets and towels and you name it, we've got a, a spreadsheet. And we assess sort of at the beginning, we have a long conversation with the client about where do you think you want to be? Um, and, and what does that look like for you? And where do you think the design budget might be? And then we plug in, even before we start, where we think the ballpark numbers could be on that project. And then we sit down and have a conversation with them and say, this is, we're just, we're just spitballing, we're throwing it on the wall, this is where we think you might be. How does that feel for you? Um, knowing that, and we, even when we, even if we have that budget and it's all approved, whenever we present a design vision or a, an actual piece of furniture, we say this is the console in front of the TV. We'll have it in three price points. We'll say this is the look we want, and we have, you know, price point A, price point B, price point C, and we have a long process of saying, you know, you can you can get. I think we can achieve your goals, and you know, spend the dollars you want to spend, mostly at the B level where you're comfortable, but there are going to be a few pieces we push you on that we really think are important, and we want you to spend the money here. And so we're constantly talking them through that. Um, and I will also say, by the end, there's always budget fatigue, and they're tired of the builder, and they're tired of the bills, and we are the ones that come in at the end saying, but we still need this, and they say, no, we're, we're tired of it. Um, so we're very aware of, of budget fatigue. And usually we'll get a call about three months later saying, okay, now we're ready to finish up. So there is a little bit of that too. We're the, we're the last people in, and so they're kind of tired of spending money at that point. Anybody else have a question? Yep. Hey, Martha, I'm curious. Um, I'm in the graphic design faculty, um, and I'm curious how graphic designers if you have one on staff, or if you work with a firm, especially in the multi-family projects where you have a lot of wayfinding environmental signage, um, do you partner with a particular firm, or do they come with um, other tech? Well, first of all, I have Corey, so that's an upset there. Um, he does he does you know, all of that for me personally at, at the at the firm, but we. Um, Session. I got an email last night. Um, we're doing a new project called the Fred, and um, they that developer has his own firm that he partners with. And so I was looking at you know like 80 logos last night. The Fred, the Fred, and we died at the Fred, and we died at that. And so uh, which is fun because I don't get to do that very often. But generally speaking, I would say on the, on the big multifamily, that falls into the architecture realm, and we'll get asked opinions, but we're not usually hire that. Occasionally we'll hire somebody 
Um, but, but more often than that, that falls under architecture. Anybody else? Time for another question? No, over here. <laughs> Hello, Martha. Um, Mark Addix. Good to see you. Mark. Um, thank you for your presentation. I'm curious if you would tell us where you find your inspiration. Where you, what, what do you follow? Who do you follow um, to keep your work fresh? And you know, the way you believe you're in the design industry here. Where, who do you follow and who do you look at for your own inspiration in design? Well, first of all, you all don't know who Mark Addix is, you should, um, because he's got an incredible background, and, and thank you, Mark, for all your work. Um, Instagram, I, I mean, Instagram has been a huge, a huge um, leader, I think, for all of us in, in finding inspiration. I still read my magazine. I mean, I love my design magazines, and, and you know, on airplane flights, uh, to Costa Rica, I, guess I get to go to Architectural Digest and El Decor and all the good ones that are still there. Um, and actually, on our local magazines, I think are doing great work. So I, I'm a huge supporter and advocate of our local design magazines. Um, I, I think the, the coasts are generally um, ahead on design, so I follow a lot of people in New York and on the, on the West Coast. It doesn't always apply, I think, for, for the Midwest uh, sensibilities, but it keeps us thinking and staying fresh. Um, and and again, I think, I mean, I'm going to spend a lot of weekend scrolling on Instagram. And, uh, but I think we're, again, really lucky in this community. I think our, our architecture firms, our design students, our museums are incredible. I mean, going to see a show at the Walker or at Mia or at MCAT, the uh, pulling from artists and local artists and all of the, the resources we have in this community, we are really lucky. Thank you, Ruth. It's wonderful to step into your world um, this morning. I have a question about design and sustainability. And if you can speak to trends, what you're thinking, what you're seeing, where that where it's going. Well, definitely going towards sustainability. So I think that's a great question. Um, I would say I would say our clients are becoming um, way more educated in sustainability and, and desiring um, you know, low VOC paints and um, windows that work and, the, and, and lead um, um, practices. And so we are, we are uh, even down to fabrics, you know, where are, they, where are they made and what are they made out of? So we are, we are learning, it's, you know, it's, you have to stay on top of that and, and follow the trends as well. And we lean heavily again on the architects um, and, and ask a lot of questions. How can we make this better? How can we serve our clients? Um, it's. I think the younger generations are, are so much more knowledgeable and aware and pushing for that. Um, we have a project right now where the homeowner was, uh, it's been in, in literally in development with the architect for about a year because of sustainable practices and he has pushed them on everything. So they're learning because the client is driving that. So the clients are demanding it and I think that's really important. I think we have time for one more. Anybody else would have one more question? If not, why don't you join me and thank you, Martha, for a great presentation. <laughs> and as a reminder, our next uh, lead speaker series is Thursday, April 7th. The Keisha Nation, Executive Director of Teach for America Twin Cities, will be our guest at that time. So hopefully we'll get to see everybody. Thanks for your time and working it. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.